This is Catherine Schneider, and I'd like to welcome you and thank the staff for preparing this education session and thank the board members for coming. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Diane. All right, fabulous. Well, thank you everyone on a Friday afternoon for us to come together. I also appreciate um, staff working to bring this together and it's our pleasure to be able to provide, again, and this is a general overview of program areas to kind of help us um, help board members and others to be able to have some understanding of all the different program areas of the department. Today's session is on our behavior health division area. Bridget, I'm wondering if you can bring up the PowerPoint. All right, fabulous. Thank you, Bridget. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, this, oops, you went way too fast. Okay, thank you. There we go. Okay, so um, as this whole group I hopefully knows, we have the Human Services Department. Um, we have our vision on the bottom. Family connections are always preserved and strengthened. And today we are here to talk about our Family Services Division area. You can see on this slide, we just want to kind of set it off as to how this connects within our whole organization. Um, we have our well being and recovery areas of behavior health, family services, and economic support, and then our administrative services area of operations and fiscal. So, last time we talked about our well being and recovery areas, um, and we talked about economic support and family services. And as I already said, We'll be talking about our behavior health division area. So we're going to move ahead and um, I'll do a quick um, overview and then turn this over to Luke to help guide us through this as the behavior health administrator. Um, this slide just initially starts to talk about how the positions are broken up into the behavior health area. And Luke, I'll turn this over to you to um kick us off all right fantastic thank you diane uh i have to first thank you for jumping on and attending this education session i'm always excited when we have an opportunity to share uh, what we do in our programs because there's lots of questions and of course what most folks see is just an acronym for the program and so uh, you'll get to dive a little bit deeper into each of these programs and learn a little bit more about what that every day, day to day work looks like. So um, you'll see our total FTEs on the side of this slide on the right side there. And this is each of the programs that we're going to be talking about. Um, this is not the chronological chronological order that they'll be in. However, um, I did decide to do it alphabetical. That way, uh, nobody felt bad about you know when they got placed. So it's uh, you know we're not ranking it. You know this is the most important program to the least. Um, but again, I am excited to share about our programs. We don't often get the opportunity to do this. And uh, I'm really going to just be emceeing this as uh, our wonderful supervisors and managers are going to be talking about the programs uh, because they truly are the experts in the programs. Uh, they know what's happening day to day. They understand the programs inside and out and they uh, help guide the important work that we do. So, with that being said, uh, we're going to jump right in and uh, I don't know if everybody heard, but uh, if you need to slither off and use the restrooms or get a drink of water, that's certainly okay. This is not the first or last time we will ever be here to answer questions. So, if you come away from today and you think, boy, I have a couple of questions about uh, what uh, Nancy said in APS, um, certainly reach out to us. We're happy to answer whatever we can. And um, we want to make sure that you're leaving this session well informed and that uh, we answer any questions that you have in the future. So, in the interest of our time and yours, we're going to dive right in and we're going to start with APS. So, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy Weltzine. Thanks, Luke. Uh, okay, so um, Bridget, if you want to go ahead, I think. Thank you. 
So um, I have oversight of adult protective services that are known as APS. And uh, we serve elders and vulnerable adults or adults at risk who've been abused, neglected, or exploited. Currently, we have five uh, staff case managers and myself in that unit, and we all have a fairly diverse background. Um, we have uh, individuals who have numerous, like 20 plus years of experience in APS and case management. And then we have some newer folks with experience in case management as well. Uh, the, we have medical expertise, with the background as well as um, behavioral expertise. So that's kind of a narrative on our group. Um, if you wanna go ahead and advance, please. So we serve individuals between 18 and actually 59 years of age who have a physical, cognitive, or a mental impairment that's permanent. And we refer to individuals in that category as adults at risk. We also uh, serve adults, elders, ages 60 and older who have experienced or are experiencing uh, abuse, neglect, self-neglect. The services we provide are protect, for protection, excuse me, advocacy, outreach, intervention, education, and guardianship and protective placement. You wanna go ahead and advance, please. Um, these are graphs to just show our growth, and I'm actually gonna give you a little bit more information um, with some narrative. So as you can see with the graphs, there's been quite a bit of growth over the past four years. APS is mandated services per statute, and it is for the groups that I spoke about earlier. During 2022, the Adult Protective Services team managed approximately 850 cases, 310, uh, were protective placements, and 542 were investigations. Each APS member has approximately 100, 170 cases, give or take a few, with approximately 60 to 62 protective placement orders, and they do about 108 to 110 investigations a year, at least in 2022. Now, the team travels throughout the state wherever individuals are protectively placed. For statute, they need to meet with the individual at least one time a year in their natural setting, just to ensure that they are uh, in the least restrictive setting and that they are in a safe environment. So the team focuses um, on several fa uh, facets with investigation, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, self-neglect, financial exploitation, emergency protective placements, and guardianships. As you can see by the graph, um, self-neglect and financial exploitation has been very busy and ever-growing. In the past few years, since, well, the past four years to be exact, um, self-neglect has increased by 38%. And financial exploitation has increased by 35%. Now, some of that may be due to um, changes in financial institution reporting laws and financial institutions now are to make financial exploitation referrals. In the past, it was rare to get a financial exploitation from a financial institution, but that's becoming very common and we usually see a few every week, if not several. Um, the APS team collaborates with several uh, parties in the community, both professional and uh, natural supports. So we work with other departments uh, within our department or other work groups, local law enforcement agencies, aging and disability resource center, public health, managed care organizations, hospitals, nursing home, group homes, adult family homes, clinics, financial institutions, as mentioned before, home health care agencies, hospice agencies, and corporate guardians. Um, these partnerships at times can be um, very intense due to the nature of the investigations. So it can be very time consuming. Um, our cases, when it comes to protective placement, once those cases are opened, um, they're not vacated until either the party passes away or they're 
or the party, um, excuse me, it's distracted for just a moment, or the party is uh, no longer in need of protective placement. Okay. So the, I wanted to just point out, um, besides the financial reporting that has increased a great deal, we've also seen um, changes within the activity of guardianship. So as of January 1st of this year, Act 97 occurred, and that's requiring all non-corporate guardians, so family member or natural support guardians are required to complete a web-based training and this is a two to three hour process. It's to be uh, completed by the nominated permanent guardian or person, and they must pass and present the, a certificate to the court system that they have passed. Now, one would think that that should be a pretty straightforward and easy thing, but as many things, um, we have a large county and we do have issues with internet access. So. What we're finding right now is we're needing to assist some families that are able to be guardians to make sure that they have the training done in a timely manner. So that's that's been a big shift and taking up quite a bit of time as well as uh, the financial investigations. Um, you can see in 2021, we had about $1.6 million that was identified that was exploited and um, the cases actually went up in 2002. The dollar amount was smaller, but it's a bit misleading because often when um, the referrals are made for investigation, they don't have a dollar amount. So it's kind of a nebulous thing until they end up in the court system. So I'm wondering if anybody has any questions for me. Hey, it doesn't look like we have any. Well, questions. I got one. Oh, okay. Thank you. I was going to wait till last, but first can be last. Uh, it's we keep hearing, you know, the number of elders is rising, which makes me think the number of elders who gets abused is going to be rising. Uh, what? plans do you have to deal with increasing numbers of referrals? Well, that, that's actually a really good question. In the past four years, we've seen an overall increase by 18%. And uh, we have went from a team of four line staff to five. And uh, at this point, we're hoping that um, it'll continue to be manageable. Back in 2019 and 18, we actually had more protective placement reviews and much fewer investigations. Um, so I don't wanna say it's balancing itself out, but there is a shift. Was that helpful, Catherine? Yeah, I, so you're placing less people in protective placements, it sounds like percentage wise, but more initial investigation kind of thing. That, that's that makes correct. me wonder why are you, why are you placing less people, why is that going down, relatively speaking? Well, there, there's a couple of reasons. Um, unfortunately, with the pandemic, we did see um, several people pass away. So that had impact. And also, um, we're seeing that families are being more planful, and they're using power of attorneys for health care, and they're including um, the power that the individual may place someone as necessary. 
So that's had impact as well as um, years ago, we kind of did a blanket thing. And it was common in most counties where if you did a guardianship, you always did a protective placement. And we've been moving away from that and really looking at what the individual needs. At this time, we have um, several adults that are in placement with family members and there's not really a need for a protective placement per statute. It doesn't really qualify. So we've moved away from doing that. And I think also we're seeing some adults that may have had a guardianship in the past are also uh, being supported with a supportive decision maker. So they're actively making decisions with another person um, acting more as a coach. And that's been very helpful. Thanks. All right, Luke, you want to continue to move along? Thank you. Sure do. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. And um, we're going to move into comprehensive community services, better known as CCS. I'm sure you guys have heard that acronym a million times. Uh, again, I want to reiterate that if you do have questions uh, that you maybe uh, don't ask today, please do reach out to us and we can help answer those. So, without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Beth O'Brien and Jenna Christensen. Beth is a manager in our CCS uh, program. She is uh, one of our two service directors and Jenna is one of our four program supervisors. So, uh, Jenna, Beth, take it away. Thank you so much for having us here today so we can talk about comprehensive community services. Um, it's a nice opportunity to talk about a program that we see so much progress for our participants with. Um, the CCS program focus is to help with recovery and we help individuals to stabilize and address their mental health and substance use concerns. Our program is really intended for people whose needs are greater than outpatient mental health counseling and less than inpatient hospitalization. And then you can see in the graph that there is, oh, go back, sorry. Just a breakdown of, um, of our full-time employees. We have 49 total. Um, Luke mentioned a little bit that there's a service director, social work manager. We've got four supervisors, um, six mental health professionals, six substance use case managers, um, and then there's 29 service facilitators, and then two resource specialists who handle a lot of the administrative and behind the scenes things with our program. Go ahead. So, comprehensive community services began in Eau Claire County in 2016, and it's a voluntary Medicaid-funded program that is person-centered and um, team-based for individuals of all ages who need ongoing services. We've had youth as young as five years old, and I believe the oldest participant was 82 years old. And I can think of an example of a five-year-old child who was in the program, um, his parents were having some pretty significant substance use issues. So this child was living with his grandma along with his two younger siblings, and he was just having so much trouble with his behaviors and grandma was trying to work full time and care for these children. And for him, it was a relatively short time in the program. I think within about six months, he was able to really stabilize some of those behaviors and get to just be a happy little boy and grandma got the support that she needed so that she could raise these kids and work and do what she needed to do. So um, we were able to wrap that one up pretty quickly. When I'm thinking of the 82 year old woman, that was a much longer process. She was someone who had um, Throughout life, she had had some mental health issues that um, caused problems for her here and there, but also some stability and working and doing well. And when she came to us, she had been hearing voices and had become very fearful and some things had happened that she lost her housing. And she was actually living on the streets at this point and 
really having um, a lot of struggles and very low quality of life. And she was able with CCS to have the kind of counseling that she needed and some services to help her with building some skills. And she ended up getting herself a very nice little apartment and making connections with neighbors. And um, when she ended the program, she had really good quality of life and was really happy with how things were going. But for her, that process was probably, I think it was, it was several years. It was probably over three years. Next slide, please. So CCS, the mission statement is CCS in Oak Park County will be built on the foundation of participant empowerment, self-determination and independence in one's own community. Participants, their family members and other natural supports will participate in shaping Eau Claire County's mental health and substance use disorder services. The principles of recovery will be integrated into the CCS program. Next slide, please. So um, participants in CCS are um, supported by their team to really identify what their own goals are for recovery. And um, then with that, they have services that help them to meet those goals so that they can have the kind of life satisfaction that they're hoping to achieve. And teams include the professional providers and also natural supports. And that might be for some people, they choose to have a family member on the team. For children, of course, there'd be family members, um, lots of times teachers, maybe principals, school psychologists. Some people choose to have, if they're in recovery, they might have their sponsor on the team. It's really whoever they choose to help them with their recovery. Next slide, thank you. So what's really cool about the CCS program is there are different services that are both traditional and non-traditional settings to meet the client or participants needs. Um, there, that's just a list of some of the services that we offer, but what, what I think is cool is that, so for a lot of people, they may have tried outpatient therapy that you would typically have in, in an office setting and with CCS, if, um, you know, if that's not meeting their needs or they're not making the progress that they, that they want, you know, we can look at non-traditional services like art therapy or a lot of the kids in our program, um, do equine therapy and. And so with CCS, there's just a lot of different services that we are able to offer to people and really um, kind of go outside of the box when it comes to looking at services and, and what might typically be seen um, in a therapy setting. So CCS has a lot of collaboration with other programs, some of those which are um, right in our agency and some of them outside. Um, a lot of our participants have been in treatment court. Some come to us um, right directly from jail. Lots of times we are making referrals to the ADRC as we get to know our participants and recognize some of their needs. Um, we might have people, um, parents might be involved in child protective services or youth in um, juvenile justice services. A lot of our participants, when they come to us, may be in and out of the hospital. They might be working with crisis and have a crisis social worker. Um, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of people from schools that are on our teams. A couple of participants have had, um, based on their needs, they've wanted to have a police officer on their team. I can think of one man that he had a lot of fear over some interactions with the police and he, um, wanted a police officer and we asked and a police officer joined our team and came to all the meetings and really tried to come up with a way that when this person was struggling, it could be a different result than the police coming in and um, ending up with some sort of being detained. So we work with whoever the participants are working with, if they wanna have them on the team. How many participants in a year? Typically, so um, typically it's a couple hundred participants that we have. So, yep. sure. 
Um, so we talked about this a little bit, but um, teams are are made up of the person's natural and professional supports again, as as identified by the participant. Um, when they get assigned, um, when they get initially assigned, they will have a CCS service facilitator who really gets you know starts with that intake and gets a lot of the assessment done, um, and then starts working on goals and identifying maybe some potential barriers and and really problem solving um, throughout. Then they also would get assigned a CCS mental health professional who typically has a therapy background um, and really provides that clinical oversight of, of what they're needing. They authorize services, um, do case consultation with the facilitator, um, helps a lot with service planning and figuring out what services are gonna be the best fit for the participant. Obviously the participant is kind of leading the bus on that, um, but they're really providing that clinical oversight of, of what might be helpful. And then they also assist with um, helping the participant graduate or discharge from the program. And then if there is any substance use concerns, then they will be assigned a substance use professional who also does very similar things that the mental health professional does, but in the substance use side of things. Um, and then again, as we mentioned, any family members or friends or community providers um, that the person would like to have on their team. And it, again, it's it's really, it's really cool because teams can be uh, very small. It can just be the facilitator, the mental health professional, and the participant, or it can be a rather large team where you've got, you know, 10, 15 people on the team. And so it's just, it's really dependent on the person and what they're really needing and what's going to be most helpful for them. So many of our participants come to us at the lowest point in their life and very likely in crisis and really struggling. So we've been working very hard to get them started with CCS and to get services as soon as possible. So back in 2021, we had a list of 120 participants that we um, were trying to go through in order to get services to people. And now we are able typically when we get that referral to get to that person within a couple of weeks, maybe a month, depending on how many referrals are coming in right at that time, and then get them started with that service facilitator where they can identify their goals and get working with service providers. Um, the referrals continue to increase. As you can see on that graph in 2020, it was 331. In 2022, it was 473 referrals to our program. So the need remains for CCS um, continues to be very high. And also I think people, the community is learning more about our program and understanding who to refer and how to refer. And we've spent a lot of time really uh, working on our triage, triage process. So when we get referrals, really taking time to, to have someone reach out and really get to know the person to understand if if they are needing this level of care or if there's other community resources that they um, could utilize that might fit their needs. Um, that's really not as of an intensive program as CCS because some people don't need this level of care. Um, and so that triage process is really working to try and understand um, what might be a good fit for them. As we said, the person have to have low income to be in this program. So it's a Medicaid funded. We are, they have to be on Medicaid. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Yep. What questions do people have? You already obviously have asked a couple of great questions so far, um, but if anyone has any questions or wants um, clarification on any of the things that we've talked about, feel free to, to ask. Uh, David Hirsch, not so much a question, just appreciation. Um, my day job is uh, an OBGYN, and I have a lot of patients who um, are Medicaid recipients who I think are, are already benefiting or could benefit from these services. So just very appreciative. That's awesome to hear. And we appreciate you directing them our way. We want to serve um, our Eau Claire citizens or Eau Claire County citizens, I mean.
All right. If no further questions, um, I think we'll move on. Oh, go ahead, Diane. Yeah. So, oh gosh, of course I have to say something. So, thank you so much, um, Beth and Jenna, for that really good overview. And I just want to make a quick statement for our board members who are with us, as Jenna indicated. Um, this is a Medicaid reimbursable program. Individuals who come to us and are not Medicaid eligible, we are finding ways to be able to still respond and give them services. So I want to make sure people understand that piece of it. Um, uh, that it were as a department, we are mandated to respond regardless of financial status to the um, uh, you know, mental health or substance abuse issues, but it doesn't mean it has to be through this program. And so this program is Medicaid um, reimbursable, but uh, how we then as a department respond if someone comes forward, we assess and then work with that individual to get connected to the appropriate resources, which might be services through the um, clinic or um, another, another way within the community. So. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, for adding that. All right, and thank you again, Jenna and Beth, for your expertise in CCS. Was I did I hear another question coming forward? I, I do have a question. If can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Yeah, thanks. This is um Kim Cronk via phone. I appreciate the last comments um that Diane shared because I was wondering about participants who may not have been screened during COVID um, from Medicaid eligibility and for some reason, you know, maybe being screened out soon as they, you know, go back to um, their previous eligibility practices. I don't know if that's, if you've heard of folks or if there's a you know one or two or a bunch of folks that are concerned about that that they may not may no longer be eligible for Medicaid and obviously then you try to to direct them to other services that may be um, helpful that that don't hinder upon or aren't centered upon having Medicaid and then that was my first question the second part is can you just share too um, how you're interacting with um, people who are currently residing in the Eau Claire County Jail, how, you know, we've also tried to um, connect with them to get them enrolled or, you know, offered Medicaid if they're eligible, as people know that they lose their benefits after being incarcerated for 30 plus days, and how people may be screened at that time potentially for, you know, becoming um, eligible for CCS services to try to help with sort of what we think is at the hospital is discharge planning, you know, and, and how important that is for not just people who are in, you know, the healthcare facilities, but for people to have a plan when they're leaving jail as well. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start the response off. Thanks, Kim, for that connection um, of qu the question. So individuals right now who are Medicaid they will continue to have Medicaid until their next review. So that might be for somebody, even though they're going to begin reviews starting in April, an individual may not have a review until next January. And they are being encouraged to not request an earlier review. So that's an important piece to know, just so that there's a continuation of support for them. And we have a responsibility then, certainly if somebody is in with CCS, they go through their review and they're determined to not have Medicaid, while we, we have a responsibility for continuity of care of helping them to be able to be connected to the next resources. And we don't know who, who's going to land in these, in these areas. We don't know how people, you know, there's, we don't know until they go through their reviews. Individuals who are in the jail, um, this is an area pre-COVID that we worked a lot with the jail on having those connections for folks to be able to know to make the um, kind of screening for economic support for them to be if they had any questions. During COVID that stopped, we need to readdress that with the jail if there is 
a need for, we used to have somebody go to the jail to be able to assist with that from economic support. Certainly the jail is aware that that connection for folks to be able to connect with the Gray Rivers Consortium within, um, uh, if they know that they're leaving within the um, a 30 day period to be able to assist to help them do that. So the jail has the information, but I appreciate you bringing up the points so that we can circle back to the jail to review that process again and how that's working. And we do have a social worker working with folks connecting um, directly with the jail that also would know to help make those connections. Thank you. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you again, Jenna and Beth uh, for that CCS 101 uh, presentation. And we are going to be moving into the outpatient clinic and I'm going to hand it over to our clinic manager, Jennifer Coyne. Thank you all so much for coming. Got to admit, I'm a little nervous, which is not typical for me. <laughs> So again, thanks for coming and thanks for being interested in knowing more about all that we do in DHS. We have a relatively small clinic downstairs on the ground floor of the DHS building. Um, there is, uh, I manage both the treatment court and the outpatient clinic. We've got seven therapists, a nurse case manager, our resource specialist, and not included in this list is we have two uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner uh, practitioners as contract employees. We provide uh, outpatient services uh, for the care of people with mental health and substance abuse concerns. Thanks, Bridget. These are a list of the services we offer. I talked about that we have two psychiatric nurse practitioners. I just want to say we're super fortunate to be able to have psychiatric nurse practitioners. Uh, Dr. Hirsch probably has a little bit of an understanding of how hard it is to get prescribers in our area, specifically for psychiatric medications. So we feel that we're very fortunate. So we offer medication management. This is also often, but not all the time, in conjunction with counseling services. We work with uh, people with, again, mental health uh, disorders or with substance abuse disorders or with both. And then we also do collaboration both within and without uh, DHS um, for uh, uh, prevention, consultation, trainings, uh, that kind of stuff. We have two satisfaction surveys coming up. Um, DHS 75, which is the, uh, I'm not gonna do any more letters and numbers, so this will be the last time, promise. Uh, the substance abuse statutes and requirements are different from the mental health statutes and requirements, and the substance abuse statutes and requirements um, has very specific questions in their substance abuse satisfaction survey that is not specific to mental health. So that's why you're gonna see two different satisfaction type surveys coming up here, the numbers for that. You can move forward, Bridget. So you can see there are questions on the general mental health side of it is, did they feel welcome? Uh, did they feel the environment was comfortable? Um, and did they feel like their therapist understood them? Um, and uh, for the most part, uh, you can see that we have um, significant positive responses. Uh, there's the, the yellow is neutral. The light blue is agree. The dark blue is strongly agree. And then the little dark maroon is strongly disagree. So, Jen, I'm sorry, could you, yeah. because we have people on the phone who aren't able to necessarily. Oh, do you want, they, so, so there's a lot of these slides. So I can go through. Just say them by read. percentage. Yeah. Okay. So for feeling welcomed, 76% strongly agreed. 18% uh, did agree. 9% felt neutral. 
4.5% said they disagreed and 4.5% said they strongly disagreed. Uh, the environment was comfortable. 50% strongly agreed, 27% agreed, 18% uh, were neutral, and 4% strongly disagreed. Feeling that their therapist understood them, 59% agreed, strongly agreed, 13% uh, agreed, wait a minute, 5%, uh, 4% was neutral. I'm sorry, they switched the colors on me. So I got a little confused there. So uh, the it was actually 50% strongly agreed, 18% agreed, 13% disagreed, 4% was neutral, and 4% strongly disagreed. This is going to be, I had no idea I was going to be reading these slides out, Diane. So, uh, uh, we, and we have quite a few of them. So let's move forward a little bit. This is David Hirsch, can I interrupt with a question and a comment? First of all, I think probably getting, the, getting a general idea of these numbers is maybe more than the specific okay. numbers. So when, but the other yeah. question is, the question is, do we have uh, national, regional, local, regional, state benchmarking on these on these numbers? No. Okay. Thanks for asking though. Uh, I, let me uh, let me back up a little bit with some of that, Dr. Hirsch. Um, it is traditionally nas nas nationwide. It is a traditionally slippery thing gathering benchmark numbers specifically for AODA. There is not uh, a national, like you say, a national benchmark. Um, and uh, so, and everyone measures their success in different ways. Does that Maybe make sense? when you describe a slide saying, okay, the highest rating was 75% on this and the lowest, the thing that is the sure, worst that news good. is rather than bit by bit. Thank you, because it confuses me too. So thank you for helping me simplify it. <laughs> Makes it much easier. Uh, feeling welcomed by the clinic staff, 63% strongly agreed. Oh, can we go back? Yeah. Oh, no, uh, you're right, Bridget, please move forward, yeah. Uh, would they return to the clinic? 63% uh, strongly agreed, 13% uh, agreed, and 9% disagreed. Would I recommend the clinic? 59% agree, uh, strongly agreed, 18% agreed, and 4% disagreed. Was the therapist's office comfortable? Only 45% strongly agreed, 29% agreed, and then that persistent 4% disagreed. We can move forward. So that was the mental health survey. This is specific, these next numbers are specific to substance abuse. Uh, do I have stable housing? 80% of people, so we, we send these surveys out six months after discharge a year and 18 months after discharge. 80% of people reported having stable housing. 80% of people abstained from using illicit substances. Only 40% said that they are successfully employed or enrolled in school. Thanks, Bridget. 60% reported having positive relationships in their life. 60% stated they avoided involvement in the criminal justice system. And with the substance abuse, 100% stated they were satisfied with the care that they got at the clinic. And if, I don't know, Diane and Luke, I don't know if we have time, but I have three just very quick case overviews that illustrate the type of, the type of people. This is, uh, some of it specific to mental health. Um, so just an example of the variety of, um, of people that we get in, 
uh, and um, also the variety of time needed to help folks move forward. Um, just just recently, we have no idea what about the time's going to be, but just recently we've been contacted by Lita Prorock of the um, Oh, Diane, why I had it, I should have written it down, but what is her? She's, she's the, uh, she's a social worker that works with responders, the co-responder co -responder with the Eau Claire Police Department. Uh, she has an elderly woman uh, in her mid to late 60s who calls her numerous times a day, maybe up to 20 times a day, and has been doing this for the past three years. Um, right before COVID or during the beginning of COVID, this woman went off all of her psychiatric medications and she hasn't been back engaged with psychiatric medications. She is very frightened. She has a lot of fear about her environment, that she's afraid of her neighbors. She's afraid of the police, which is a little, uh, you know, since she's calling the police recent, that recently, I th actually that's really kind of hopeful. Um, uh, so a lot of possible, we don't know possible delusions, uh, and certainly paranoia per Lita's uh, uh, report. Um, she were able to get her in today for uh, just an administrative intake. So um, Lita had contacted us and said, hey, can you help with this? And we said yes. So uh, that we're very happy to be able to do that. We had a gentleman who was released from a Texas um, hospital to Eau Claire where his family was after a significant suicide attempt. Um, he was coming, uh, his son lived here in Eau Claire. He saw one of our therapists for about four months during that time. He um, was uh, treated for his depression, both in therapy and with medications, um, and had then discovered reasons to continue to live. Part of that had to do with his uh, getting involved in community activities like his church and in music, um, as well as his grandchildren and his uh, son's family. And um, he discharged after about four or five months. They all moved to Washington, D.C. So, um, but he was, and he was uh, ready for discharge. So that was uh, an example of a short-term client we might have coming to the, to the clinic. Um, a longer-term example is a gentleman with both um, substance abuse and mental health. He was in Mogadishu, Somalia in 1993 and was a grunt on the ground during what we informally call the Black Hawk Down incident. Um, and uh, because of his childhood abuse and that military experience, he has significant, significant PTSD. Um, if we know anything about military, we know that one of the things they do is they, um, they train out the flight the freeze and the fawn until only the fight mechanism is um, the strongest in the brain. Um, and he uh, vacillated between um, bouts of uh, violence towards himself, towards others, and his preferred method of suicide would be, as he calls it, death by cop. Uh, we've been seeing him for three years. He's made significant improvement. He was unable to maintain um, uh, employment for more than uh, two or more than more than six months um, prior to coming to the clinic because of his hair trigger temper while on the job. He's maintained employment for two years, um, and he is now stable enough to start working on more of his trauma with EMDR. Uh, and he is uh, an example of our long-term clients and a very good example because the majority of clients who come through our doors have significant trauma histories. Oh, I think I'm done talking if anyone's got any questions. Well, and just to clarify, Jen, you mentioned EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And I know it's come up in the board before, but it's really one of the best, if not the best uh, treatment for complex trauma for individuals. And it's a modality of treatment of which um, all of our therapists uh, either are or will be trained in. David Hurst with a question. Uh, I you, you, the last case report or case study that you you told us about was a veteran, correct? Yes. So, I mean, uh, with the understanding that 
Veterans Affairs, Veterans Services uh, offer a lot of services to veterans naturally, uh, but but also that I know there's a lot of overflow and a lot of difficulty in accessing those services. Is that something that you're seeing a lot of as veterans uh, being addressed in your program? He, um, uh, we do have vet veterans with him specifically. He refuses to access. He does. He does. He he had had some. Um, services through the Veterans Administration previous to coming in with us, and um, absolutely, I, I I don't know what his past experience is, except that he absolutely refuses to access that now. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Do you ever have veterans who use your service? but it's paid for by the VA? We are almost certified with TRICARE, which is a VA specific um, uh, uh, federal health insurance. So TRICARE does frequently contract um, and it takes a few more steps to get licensed and certified with them. That being said, I can clarify that we do serve veterans um, at times and we work with them to develop, uh, well, anyone who is either underinsured or uninsured, work with them to develop uh, a payment plan that is suitable for um, for the client. If they, yeah, if they're uninsured or underinsured. The vast majority of our clients have um, Medicaid. somebody wouldn't be on both VA and Medicaid, right? Yes, no. Uh, again, um, uh, he, something, something, I don't think he has an honorable discharge. Yeah. Well, in my experience with, with uh, veterans who are accessing uh, Veterans health care is that it can be very difficult to navigate and very difficult to find competent services just because of the bureaucracy is pretty complicated. So I see a lot of veterans myself, yeah. but, have, but the, the process to get, um, to get sent to me uh, for my services is pretty difficult for them. So yeah. I, I can, I can yeah. only imagine that's true for all other sorts of care, including behavioral health. Uh, and then if you think about um, having very uh, uh, low ability to deal with stress and having to uh, having to negotiate a large system um, that uh, that that in and of itself, when you're talking about something like post-traumatic stress disorder can be prohibitive in getting care for that. Any other questions before we pass the torch to the next department? Yeah, this is Kim. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to make the comment. Thank you so much for sharing some um, narratives. I think that's always really helpful, you know, in addition to percentages and, and that type of um, data that you shared. I really appreciate some of the, the stories. And uh, to me, the takeaway or one of the large takeaways from the last one that you shared with how critically, critically important it is for all of us not to tunnel our thinking into the binary violent versus nonviolent and the ways that we address um, trauma and harm. Because when I hear that gentleman's story, I hear that um, just, I feel like time and time again in different instances with folks that have no um, connection to the military. So I think we sometimes as a community or society sort of have this soft spot for veterans as we should, um, but then thinking about how much it makes sense for people that have um, histories of violence to, to not want to assist and, and provide services and support and caring and nonviolent approaches um, to care, because it just makes our community that much healthier and safer and better. So I just, that was glaring to me when you were talking about that gentleman's story, and I just 
really want to say that it's crucial that we start thinking about that. If you're, you're deserving of this, if maybe your history is nonviolent and you're deserving of that, if it's violent and all of the things that, that go into that. And I'm probably preaching to the choir, but that just was blaring at me as you were telling that gentleman's story. So I just wanted to make that comment and, and thank you for sharing that presentation I, as well. I, I so appreciate that comment. Kim, I so appreciate that. I mean, when you think about people seeking behavioral health services, obviously it's because something's not working for them. And if you dig deeper, it is typically experiences in their childhood. Um, and then when the clinic is the last resort for them, we have weeded out a whole bunch of high functioning people who are getting services elsewhere. And so we have highly traumatized people um, men, women, and now that we have the in-home therapist, um, children as well, um, who never got the care they needed. And so therefore their trauma spiraled in, uh, in directions that may have included violence towards others because of the violence perpetrated on them. So thank you so much uh, for that comment. And you're right. Um, uh, when we when we start uh, using these dichotomous things, this person is violent, this person did that, they have this criminal history, and so therefore they are not worthy of good, competent, caring services, then we have made the streets that we walk in Eau Claire just a little less safe because those people are out there and their mental health is continues to be out of control. Thanks for all you're doing, Jen. Thanks, Kim. I really appreciate it. Any idea why your stats about comfort of the office and stuff are at some of your lowest stats? Well, you, we are. You on need the new floor. furniture or what? No, I I think we're on the ground floor and we're a little crowded. We're we make do, I think all of our, uh, all of us have done a really good job at making our offices welcoming and, um, and, and homey and cozy. Um, we have the freedom to do that here. Some places don't, all the offices have to look very uniformly the same. Um, but we are in an old building with cinder block walls and, you know, you know, uh, you know, okay. uh, durable carpeting and, and things like that. So, um, and some of the offices are small. Uh, um, and I think we do a great job. And um, I would take this job over uh, a job with a huge office with windows and uh, any day. This is where she clearly didn't need to be nervous about this presentation because it was very strong. <laughs> so, oh, thank you, Dr. Hirsch. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I think uh, is it time to move forward to the next person? <laughs> I believe it is, unless there are other burning questions that need be answered. All right. Well, thank you, Jen, uh, for the presentation on the clinic. It's much appreciated. And we are going to be moving into children's long term support, better known as CLTS. And presenting on CLTS, we'll have Jim LaDuke and Taylor Johnson. Jim is our social work manager in CLTS, and Taylor is a program supervisor in CLTS. So, again, without further ado, take it away, guys. All right, I think uh, Taylor is going to give you a brief description um, of what the CLTS, CLTS program is overall, and then we'll kind of get into the uh, the finer details with some of the data we will present. Thanks, Jim. As Luke said, my name is Taylor Johnson. I am the program supervisor in CLTS. Um, so what is CLTS? Uh, we are a program that provides children with disabilities and their families individualized supports and services that help those children grow and live their best lives in the home and community. So our focus as support and service coordinators are really to connect those families in our programs with different services in the community to meet their identified goals. 
what some of those services may look like. Um, we have 30 different service codes, so I'm not going to name them all, but there um, are some big contenders that we see frequently authorized for our families. One of the biggest ones is respite to offer um, caregivers a break from caring for their high needs children. Um, we can authorize certain medical and therapeutic supplies that can't be funded through Medicaid. Emergency response systems, if we have children who have a history of elopement and running away from their caregivers to, where, to the point where they can't be located, um, we can fund um, services to be able to locate them. Modifications to home or vehicles to make that home or vehicle more accessible for the child enrolled. Daily living skills is another one that really focuses on building those skills in, in cooking and navigating around the community, cleaning their home, et cetera. Um, and then another one is educational support for caregivers to really support them with understanding their child's needs and um, caring for them. So again, we have 30 different service codes to access in CLTS. Um, and those were just some of the bigger ones that we see authorized a good bit. Uh, so since we are a long term care program, we often serve children for long periods of time, many, many years, most of the time, and some we serve from the moment they're born up until their 18th birthday when they can qualify for adult services. Um, so I think that is a brief overview. Jim, do you want to? Is this based on parental income at all? That's a great question. Uh, CLTS is not income based. Uh, to enroll in CLTS, you just have to qualify for via the functional screen. Um, so that was another great point that I missed going over. CLTS actually has its own form of Medicaid. Uh, so if a child is enrolled and they do not qualify for Badger care um, because of their parents' income, we can provide them with a source of, uh, of Medicaid just through being enrolled in our program. Yep, that was a very good question. Um, and really is when you look at the significance of some of the uh, disabilities that uh, the children have that we serve, um, I think everybody uh, recognizes, especially on the top end, that no parents or guardians could serve that child and all their needs in the home by themselves. And thankfully, if you look at what uh, a social net, a uh, safety net is about, it really, I think, it, 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 at least, okay, I, I'm biased, but we have to be able to do whatever thing possible to be able to keep a kid in the home with their parents in the community uh, because the alternative is that that child would be raised uh, you know in a medical facility which is which is just not um anywhere we want to go and fortunately we don't have to with this program um i think to put a face or uh, to put a scenario to it um yeah, I, I'm new to the program, so I, I went around and met all the staff, and I, I have asked them, well, what uh, what client has touched you the most? And one of the ones that really rise to, you know, you know, kind of really hit me is that we received a referral from about an infant in the hospital, in ICU, probably never going to get out of the hospital, and would probably die within that first year. Well, that's, you know, refer to our program. We, you know, put our heads together, you know, sign case. And uh, the goal from that parent was they wanted their child with them before he turned one. And, you know, hospitals and the doctors have great liability, uh, you know, but we know what we can do and provide in the community. So, it finally got to a point where a plan was, um, you know, met hospitals ability to discharge and we got, we got them, got the infant home in a year and he's still, you know, moving along here. So talk about life changing, uh, because in other scenarios, 
you know, you can have a child with significant issues, whether they be physical disabilities, developmental disabilities, or, or um, mental health, that are so severe that it requires a parent to, to be home with them all the time. Well, we all know that half of, um, you know, if, if a parent isn't working, that really takes a toll obviously out of the family, family finances. But if you're a single parent and you have other kids and you have to stay at home, um, you know, that's just a scenario that fortunately we don't want uh, those families to have to endure. So um, I'm very, like I said, I'm very biased about the, the impacts we can make with families and, um, you know, we continue to to uh, provide those services, it, you know, at a higher higher level, I know there's a lot of talk about the wait list, so we will be giving some more attention to that. But um, the screen up um, on the, the PowerPoint screen up now is kind of about our staffing, um, which looks a little odd to me, but really. It's the staffing, you know, we have like a third that are old guard. They're not old themselves. I would never call my seasoned staff old. We have veterans, about a third of them are veterans. Uh, about a third of them um, are kind of in the middle, but really are two to five years. You can kind of see it is a wave in three waves. And then because our last third has come on, probably from action still of these board members that are on, on now. Uh, so our last third are are really new uh, to twenty two. Uh, can and I then, just like add I said, in, Jim? Can yeah. I just add also that because I didn't say this earlier um, that there are two CCS service facilitators who are also part of this team because of that interconnection with the CCS program and the CLTS. Um, program. So just wanted to note that really the entire team encompasses 19 people because there's two service facilitators also part of the team. Yeah, thank, thank you, Diane. Uh, and I think that just goes to show uh, because one of the target groups for CLTS is mental health, which is CCS. They can be dual, dually eligible. Uh, and that, that means we got to work better at, at being a team uh, and providing those services as a department to those families. We also work quite a bit uh, with um, with clients in the child protection system as well, and I would say we have pretty good working relationships with them as well. Next slide. Okay, so. I, um, obviously, I never attended a board meeting, but I know just looking uh, and hearing, you know, the wait list is is quite significant uh, concern uh, here at, at Eau Claire County. Uh, so I did put the third quarter breakdown. Um, I think you guys get monthly data, and sometimes it's not easy to see just from month to month. So I did um, I did highlight or include fourth quarter 22 data. So for those on the phone, uh, the, the, the clients we're, you know, the families we were able to add for October, November, December, totaled 32 in, in those three months. You know, and November and December is not an easy month to kind of assign cases with vacations and, and, uh, and clients having a busy schedule themselves. But so we still were able to uh, add 32 clients in the last quarter, which uh, was pretty significant. Um, unfortunately, we had 49 addition, additional families added to that wait list in just that the last quarter of 22. Um, so the uh, one thing we're going to be tracking is wait list uh, net or loss. And if we're looking at that from the direction of the wait list rather than our case. Load. So uh, 
A positive number means we add it to the wait list. A negative number would mean we take away from the wait list. But uh, so for the end result of the last quarter of 22, 17 were still added. Even, even when we put on, take on 30 new families, we still had a gain of 17 uh, to add it to the wait list in that quarter. Also within that last quarter of 22, you know, and that's that's a quarter that just ended in December. Um, we had nine, we had nine uh, clients discharged from our caseload. Um, so all all total for 22, we had 133 added to the wait list which brought the wait list uh, at the end of the year to 249. Um, like I said, I'm not sure what, what, what has been discussed in previous um, board, board meetings about this. I will say, um, you know, 22, I, I wasn't here, but no one could have predicted that it would go up to 133 in one year because uh, for 21, it was 74. So it almost doubled in one year. And I think um, 21 was somewhat was higher because it, I think that previous year uh, ended at 46 to the wait uh, on the wait list. So it has doubled almost every year. Um, Do you know how long the longest person has been waiting? Well, I, I, we, we did check into that and we are into 2020. So when I got here, I kind of thought maybe this wait list was 10 years old, which has its own, uh, you know, there's so many X factors when you talk about wait lists and how to eliminate it. Uh, one is that, you know, it's a long, it's a 10 year wait list. And some of those refer 10 years ago are already 18. So you can just cross them off or. Uh, but but that's not the case here in Eau Claire. Uh, we are we are into 2020. Uh, people who were put on the wait list in 2020, um, so we don't have, we we can't say oh we anticipate that many people aging out. What we have come to find out though is that uh, people are still difficult to get a hold of. So even when you're, you know, and this is what I talk about. Um, how difficult it is to explain what makes up the wait list and what the procedure is, is there's so many variables. One is that even with 2020 uh, people coming off the wait list, um, we are kind of chasing our tail, trying to reach those folks. Um, and so here we are poised and ready to take people off, the families off the wait list. And then we're waiting weeks uh, for, you know, we're excited and we're hoping that they're excited, but uh, there's been quite a few cases where we're not getting call backs. So we don't know if we have the right debt, you know, right contact information or if they moved out or they themselves do not believe uh, that they are no longer in need of services. So, uh, can you bypass them after a month or? Yes, we, we like do that? have a process, but yes, and we will, we will move on uh, and continue to. Um, um, move on to the next people, but when when that is happening uh, with great frequency um, across, you know, seven, eight uh, social workers, the numbers do not move all that quickly. So that's just, you know, and that's not the leading one, uh, you know, the leading cause of why uh, the wait list isn't moving, but it's just one of very quite a few. Um, reasons. Dr. Hirsch wanna, has a question. Uh, before Dr. Hirsch, uh, if I could just say, I want to point out the dynamic that Jim is talking about, that uh, we are so grateful for the additional resources provided to this program in 2022, but we have seen an unprecedented growth of kids in the wait list while we are still taking kids off. So our job is undone here. We still have some room to go. We're not, you know, we're by no means fully assigned, 
but uh, but the trend is concerning and pointing towards needing additional resources. So uh, we can spend um, additional time at future board meetings talking about the wait list if we want to. Um, but I, I, I'm sure that you can tell just as I can from the depth of which Jim is going into this, we're making every effort to reduce the wait list numbers. And when we have had 133 people come forward in 22 to get on our wait list, that is a surge in demand for this program that could not have been predicted uh, when I asked you for five staff in 2022, if I had known we were gonna have 133, my request would have been different. So there's lots to work on here in this. And I just wanna make sure that we understand the trend that we are taking kids off and we are also seeing many more families come forward being placed on the wait list. Thanks. Yeah, and I just went into a little bit of detail about uh, difficulty in, in reaching parents uh, primarily. Uh, just, it's just not a matter of, uh, we have, you know, we have staff and we have a waiting list. <laughs> just so many, so many things involved. Now, what we can do on our end is make, make uh, we have made quite a few uh, uh, streamline, I would say, uh, changes, and we are we we are poised definitely to to plow through the wait list uh, at, at a at a faster pace than we have in the past. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, we can talk more about the wait list or come back and a, uh, a answer questions about the wait list, but I'd like Taylor to kind of, you know, the wait lists, um, we want to serve them uh, more than anybody because we know what kind of impact we can make on them uh, uh, with those families. But I, I also think it's really important to to really take a look at who, who we do serve currently it, because we're making an impact currently with them. So. Taylor's going to go over our cur current caseload a little bit too. Dr. Hirsch has a question. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so just to help me understand, I'm guessing that the waitlist isn't like first on, first served. It's there's some sort of a triage or um, prioritization process. Can you describe a little bit how that's done? Yeah, I can explain that. So. For counties that do have a wait list, it is a first come first pop first serve policy. However, we do have a, uh, it's called a variance policy where if a child is deemed to be in a crisis and they lay out the certain circumstances, some of which being um, substantiated child abuse, homelessness, um, death of a caregiver, things like that. Um, to where we can expedite enrollment of that child, but typically it is a first come first serve basis. Okay, thank you. I have another question I think about the, about the wait list, but it's maybe not as germane to the conversation. I'll just put a marker in for it. Question has come up at, at board meetings uh, quite frequently that uh, if, if, you know, so well, number one, do we think that additional staff would um, would help alleviate this crisis? And if so, would it be possible to numerically correlate a, a new staff member with a decrease in the wait list? Um, I, again, I don't think it's germane right now. This is a training, not a <laughs> financial discussion, but that is something that's come up. I think it's important that we're able to do that um, in terms of funding in the future. I, I think we can, I think it's premature. I think we need to further discuss and you know, the first two months, uh, I've been here. I've really been crunching the numbers and flipping, uh, flipping them every different direction and getting a lot of input from everybody. Uh, but the, I think the administration, you know, from top to bottom, uh, really has to uh, hone in so we can have a really, uh, if there is an ask that is well thought out, not just for now, but in the future. So, you know, and, and you're, you're right on this is about education. Um, we didn't, I, there was no intent uh, for us to hijack it and make this about, you know, uh, de, you know demanding staff by any means. These, these are numbers and they kind of speak for themselves, uh, I think, but with further explanations, I 
I think it, um, in a little more detail, I think everybody can kind of come to the same conclusion. Um, so I, I supervise that specific, specifically yes and yes. Yes, uh, we are making that assessment right now as it is our budget planning time has just commenced. And yes, uh, you can correlate caseload to a, a single worker. So I just wanted to be clear on that and thank you for your interest in hearing that because we'll be talking about that in future board meetings for sure. Yeah, I appreciate it. It wasn't specifically my concern, but I, just speaking on behalf of other members, I thought you know, I'm glad I'm glad it's being addressed. But I don't really think it's for this training. So sorry, sorry about it up. But no, we we, I, we have a pretty good working numbers for all that stuff. Excellent. Thank you, and thanks for the answers. Okay. Well, just to bring us back to what we are working on present day and what our goal is for 2023. Um, just to give some history uh, with 2022, I think uh, most of you are aware, but just a brief rundown. 2022, as you all know, we did have several positions included in the budget to bring on to, um, I guess, fight our wait list problem that we have. Um, and five of those positions were new social workers and we unfortunately due to maternity leaves and just um, hiring pools, et cetera, did not get all five staff hired on until August 8th. So that was a good bit into the year. And then we still had to train those staff to be able to start opening cases. Um, on top of that, I already mentioned maternity leaves. We had three within their program within our program, one of which was my own. Um, so for a brief period there, um, the supervisor was out as well. So that halted enrollments a little bit as well. Um, and then, as you know, Jim has mentioned that he is newer and he did not uh, we did not fill the manager role until December. So there was some staffing um, delays within 2022 that impacted our abilities to enroll as many children as we'd hope. However, we did um, make some pretty significant gains, even with those difficulties in play. We enrolled about 80 children throughout the year within 2022. Um, so year to date, we are at 299 children enrolled in our program. Throughout the rest of the year, our hope is to enroll 125 children. Um, and in order to do that, we have increased caseloads capacities for all of our staff or expectations, um, even our veteran staff. So we're hoping that they will take on a few more cases as well. They're already pretty up there in numbers, um, but pushing them to add on a few more. And then also building those caseloads for the staff that we hired in 2022. Um, another thing that we have rolled out is making new assignments every couple of weeks. And as Jim mentioned, sometimes we're chasing down families. We have um, this year put some restrictions on that with giving a shorter time frame for families to get back to us before we move on to the next family. Obviously, if that family gets back to us, we will um, continue to pursue enrollment, but just not spending as much time chasing down when we have other families that are not are knocking down our door to get services. Um, so those are some plans that we have for 2023. Um, again, we're hoping to make some pretty significant progress uh, with enrollment, um, but we are still seeing a heavy number of referrals coming through and screening eligible just so recently. In night, um, January, we added 19 kids to the back of our wait list. So, it's a constant battle, but we are working as hard as we can. Our staff are truly very motivated to um, serve as many families as we can this year. Jim, do you have anything to add to that or do we wanna open it up for questions? I can say that better myself. Thank you, Taylor. All right. So Taylor and Jim, I'm wondering, um, just to shift the conversation, just a little bit for a brief second is um, sometimes we get questions from our board members around items that the program is able to purchase that may seem um, 
uh, not um, that may seem unusual to people that were purchasing an item. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how those determinations are made in terms of those needs and the purchase of an item. Sure, I, I'll do it quick and then Taylor will <laughs> add the finishing touches. Um, all of them do have, you know, uh, Taylor mentioned the 30 different codes. Uh, they do have to fit in one of those codes. Um, and it also has to apply uh, very logical to an outcome on, on the plan. Um, and I, I know some of the ones you're thinking about because um, in a different county, I was, I was questioned about those too. And it looks like we're, we're playing Santa Claus or just handing out uh, fun stuff. But when, when you think about um, some of the issues that, that little kids have, a lot of them is, is sensory or tactile. So you'll get a lot of those what could be also considered toys, but they're using them to further develop their skills in, in, in certain areas. Um, and then uh, maybe electronic purchases. Well, some uh, some don't have those. Uh, well, even if they, some programs that we use require an iPad or some kind of computer to to run them off the you know this application or an app that so they need an iPad. Some use iPads for just that's how they can communicate with 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 others. So. Um, if there's, but overall, they do have, it does have to be an outcome identified on the plan, and it does have to fit an allowable service code um, uh, within the, the waiver program. And those are universal. I mean, the questions that Eau Claire County Board are asking are good ones, because they're the same ones probably asked in all 72 counties, because uh, if you don't really know the kids that we're serving and their issues, a lot of that stuff really doesn't make sense. Thank you, Taylor. Jim. Okay. Any other questions? All right, well, Jim Taylor, thank you very much for uh, your insights into CLTS and for sharing those. Uh, we are going to move on uh, to our crisis services program. Uh, and we've got social work manager Santana Stoudy uh, in the program presenting as well as Jess Buckley, our um, supervisor in the program. So Jess Santana, take it away. All right, perfect. Well, thank you, Luke. As Luke mentioned, um, my name is Santana Sadi. I'm the crisis services manager here for Eau Claire County. Um, so crisis services um, currently is made up of 12 positions. Um, as you can see, there's a breakdown there. Um, the positions are Jess and myself, and then we currently have seven um, social workers on the team, and we'll break down a little bit more what crisis services look like here in the next slide. Um, and then we have two uh, current open positions. Um, a case manager and peer specialist is currently open, and then we have a resource specialist that helps with our um, admin support needs. Um, so crisis services in general, um, as it states there, it says the mental health crisis system is more than a single program. It is an organized set of structures, processes, and services in place to meet all types of urgent and emerging mental health crisis needs in a community effectively and efficiently. Um, so that's a lot of verbiage, but essentially what it says, um, or what it, I interpret that to mean is that, you know, crisis can be anything um, from, you know, mental health, AOTA, housing, uh, you name it, individuals that touch our crisis system can be experiencing a crisis in many different areas of their lives. Um, okay. Bridget, if you would go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so our crisis services, um, essentially the components of that um, emergency mental health services. So um, each of our positions are capable of 
completing all of these services for crisis, um, but each part of the team is a little bit different. So I'll go into a little more detail about that. But mental health emergency services consists of um, coordination of out-of-home placements, including psychiatric hospitalization if necessary. This can also include group home placements as well. Um, individual and family crisis assessments, interventions, co-response and safety planning, mobile on-site face-to-face um, -face crisis assessments, telephone crisis intervention, community outreach, and ongoing case management. So there's a lot of components to our crisis program. Um, one of our primary components of that is our crisis linkage and follow-up team. So that is a DHS 34 certified program. So all of our crisis workers, all seven of them are capable of completing crisis assessments. However, um, we have four primary workers in the crisis linkage and follow-up role. So what that looks like is um, we contract with Northwest Connections 24 seven and those crisis reports are sent to the county the following business day and we follow up on those crisis reports. So this can be, you know, anybody calling in to give information about an individual, um, the individual themselves is assessed, law enforcement's a typical caller, um, hospitals, I mean, anybody can call Northwest Connection. So we get calls from everybody. Um, so my team of four follows up on those crisis reports. Question on that, how yeah. does 988 feed into that now? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so with the rollout of this this year, um, they do their own crisis assessments. However, if an individual, if they feel an individual is meeting the need of hospitalizations, they do transfer that phone call over to Northwest Connections. If that helps a little bit. At the hospitalization level of crisis, not at the is going to need further services level. Yes, that is correct. Yep, 988 cannot authorize an emergency detention hospitaliz hospitalization kind of level of care. But so that do would... they, if somebody's clearly going to need more than that one chat, do they make a referral to you or um, not necessarily? Not necessarily. It's it's kind of a hit and miss, honestly. <laughs> um, we haven't seen too many referrals come through them. So usually only if it's rising to the level of hospitalization needs. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. So yeah, um, as I was mentioning, so our team follows up. So if they'll call the individual themselves, um, get them connected with the resources they need, which can range anywhere from medication management, counseling, um, AOTA services, housing, um, Badger care, you name it. We give them the information and try to get them connected with those resources so they can um, address their mental health needs. Um, and then if an individual is hospitalized, my team follows up with that process as well. So that can involve um, the court process, um, which I won't get into too much detail about that, but they do follow along with that process. And then if an individual ends up on a mental health order, then they case manage those individuals as well. Um, so that's just like a primary overview of our crisis linkage and follow-up team and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then I will send it over to Jess so she can talk a little bit more about the community portion of it. Thanks, Santana. Um, so, like, um, Luke had said, I am Jess Buckley. I'm the program supervisor for the crisis program um, and the staff that I supervise work in our community reentry team. So this includes. Um, 2 workers that provide community reentry services. Um, through the jail, and then uh, we have a mental health liaison that um, corresponds with the sheriff's department on any crisis calls um, that might come in during the day. And then we have a current vacancy right now um, that we're hoping to fill here in the very near future. Um, that will be a co-response position that will be with the um, Eau Claire Police Department, and the hours for that will be three to eleven. So with the community reentry team that works in the jail, we have two workers, um, one of which uh, focuses more on the short term needs of individuals coming into the jail. And then the other worker focuses on more of the long term needs for individuals that are coming into the jail. Um, so that short term worker um, spends a lot of time meeting with individuals in booking. Um, 
if someone's flagged with a mental health or substance use need or history, um, that workers connecting with those individuals prior to them going to their initial court hearing and then just helping them get connected to any supports and services um, that might be necessary upon their release. A lot of those individuals are um, booked and released within about 24 hours. Um, and then if they do remain in the jail for a, a shorter period of time, she's then connecting with them and again, just trying to navigate some of those resource things. I know a question was posed earlier about how to get individuals connected to like medical assistance and benefits and things. So those are things that she's reviewing um, with those individuals when they come into booking. Um, and then if there's any crisis assessments that might be needed while individuals in the jail, that worker is kind of the primary for that. So doing those assessments to see if someone um, is needing like an emergency detention. Um, and then that long-term worker, um, he's case managing those individuals that are gonna be in jail for a little bit longer period of time, like a month or more. And then um, working with those individuals um, so long as they choose to continue to engage um, upon their release and again, trying to get connected to different supports and services. Um, so some of the things that that worker might be helping get connected to would be different programs within our county, uh, maybe some outpatient services that might be in the community, really looking at um, basic needs, um, trying to get them connected to different like housing programs if they're needing support with trying to figure out resources for like food, clothing, just really focusing on that basic um, need. And then just, again, those long-term supports that'll be able to help address any mental health or substance use needs, um, as well as any referrals to other um, um, agency entities like adult protective services, or um, if someone's needing help from like the clinic. Um, and then we also have the mental health liaison position. So again, um, one worker is co-responding with the sheriff's department um, from 8 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. Um, and a lot of the work that she's doing is going to be um, really addressing, again, those crisis situations, uh, depending on how the individual defines it. So it's kind of more of a loose um, process, I guess. It's not always like an emergency detention situation or hospitalization that she might be going on. A family might be experiencing a crisis or kind of um, needing some support with navigating different resources in the community. Um, or again, might be just doing some of that mental health assessment too to get individuals connected to those services. Um, and then same with the position that we're hiring, the 3 to 11 police department. So that'll be um, from 3 to 11 with, with the police providing those assessments and really being kind of just that resource specialist for, for the department um, and knowing what services might be available to that individual. Um, and then just kind of a little branch off from, um, it's not really a full-time position, but it's been worked into one of our current positions within the community reentry team, which is our homeless outreach transitional team. Um, so we have a worker that's kind of working part-time with the police department and other community entities and trying to get um, unhoused individuals connected to different supports and resources. Okay, Bridget, you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so just some recent data that we pulled. I had a question about the unhoused piece. Uh, I think there's somebody maybe from, L from LSS that goes to uh, Sojourners and works with people and then I think maybe there's a person from DHS that goes to uh, Haven House or am I getting mixed up? Are people offered services in both places or is that the same person that does that or help me out there? So I know there's a number of initiatives within the community that are really focused on housing, and that's something that they're trying to pull together to kind of get everyone on the same page through like a like a joint initiative. Um, the homeless outreach 
team that the individual that we have at DHS that um, is a member of that. She works with um, primarily the police department right now. They schedule times once a week to just kind of go out and um, seek out individuals mm -hmm. in, in places that seem to be kind of common where they're spending their time throughout the day and then they're offering those services. I think at times they have gone into like Haven House or near Sojourner, um, but it's not like a regular thing. It's usually like once a week and, and where they focus their time and efforts just kind of depends on um, whatever information they might have at the time as far as where individuals are kind of hanging out. So as Jess was just explaining, we're beginning, we've been evolving and emerging with more outreach right now through working with and that co-responder or, or um, as part of an initiative with the, with the police department. And we are assessing with our community partners how to be able to be collaborating with them in meeting people where they are at in the community. So it is evolving and, and expanding. And just to Thanks. clarify as well, <clears throat> if we do get called out, because we have strong partnerships with our community entities. So if we do get called out to help assist uh, with with certain things, I know at one point in time, Sojo, uh, there was an overdose death there. Uh, we were asked to help provide support. So we had some staff deploy. Uh, we have had staff at Haven House as well to help do some level of assessment and assist um, with their programming there. So certainly uh, when we're asked, we do respond uh, with staff when that's needed. But that's kind of funneled through the police at this point. No, typically the, the entities themselves can reach out. So someone from Haven House, someone from Sojourner can reach out and connect with us here. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Luke. All right, so yeah, just looking at um, some data that we had pulled. So this data in particular um, was surrounding Midway when we had Midway crisis bed here in Eau Claire County. Um, so it's taking a look at emergency detentions and Winnebago admissions. So we pulled the last six months. Um, so May 2021 to January 22 was when um, right the six months before Midway closed, and then May 2022 to January 2023 was right after Midway closed. Um, so we just kind of pulled that data just to see if there's any interesting correlations with getting or our crisis bed closing and the number of hospitalizations. So as you see from the data, it says that we saw a 13.5% increase in emergency detentions and almost a 27% increase in Winnebago admissions during this time period. Okay. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, um, and then this just also shows our hospitalization over the course of the year. So between, you know, 2018 and 2022, of course, we can see, continue to see a rise in not only the number of people that are hospitalized, but also how many days they are hospitalized. Um, I think in correlation with this, we've just seen an upward trend in crisis of individuals needing a longer time to stabilize, which has led to longer hospitalization stays. Um, and that has continued to, to increase over the last four or five years. Perfect. And then this last slide here is also just um, our diversion from hospitalization. So the little, the red bar, of course, is our diversion. So that means individuals, you know, that were set up on a safety plan um, or stayed home individually and the total number of crisis contacts for the year. So as we can see, um, of course, over the years, um, our hospitalizations, or our total, sorry, our total crisis contacts over the years, um, it's been pretty consistent. I would say it's decreased a little bit, um, which also leads to decrease in diversions as well. But another piece to this too, this is only um, individuals that we know of that ended up on diversion. So 
the total number of crisis contacts include, you know, notes that we get on individuals. So people that are just calling in about other people and providing information. Um, so these numbers, they're in a sense, it's kind of skewed because it doesn't include all of that either. This is just strictly individuals that were set up on a safety plan and diverted from hospitalization compared to our total number of crisis contacts. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Um, hopefully that makes sense. One point for those on the phone, I would like you to be aware of the fact that the crisis contact numbers are uh, just looks like about 3000 in 2018 mm -hmm. and still just barely under 3000 in 2020 and over a thousand uh, situations where hospitalization was diverted, meaning mm -hmm. that the stated response from the individual was, uh, I need to go to a hospital, or the question was, does this person need to go to a hospital, resulted in them remaining safely in their own home. So that's a main uh, factor of crisis. I also wanted to talk a bit about the, because uh, the numbers matter here, on the on Winnebago data. Although we did experience more overall days of Winnebago in 2022 and overall admissions increased, the length of stay has shortened from the previous year. So that speaks to the community work that we are trying to do. And I know that we have talked often about Trempolo County Healthcare Center and the difficult to place individuals that end up there. And we're really seeing that uh, ring true, that we're finding community options for some people, and then there is that group at Trempolo that we are not finding community options for. So I think it's a positive indicator that length of stays are down slightly, uh, even when the admissions are up. But I, but I think that's important to note in this data. Yeah, Bridget, if you go back to the prior slide, um, so what, what based on, because, you know, Santana's right, it looks like there's this increase in length of number of days. That's what we're getting, you know, billed for. But when you look at that with the increase of numbers, really our overall length of stay has, um, diminished and, uh, that, which is what Ron is referencing. So thank you both. Mm -hmm. And I would also just like to point out to us, as I'm sure everybody is aware with COVID and everything too, that has also impacted admissions to Winnebago too, because they're the still a lot of um, of our private entities or private hospitals that we contract with. Um, if an individual tests positive for COVID, they are shipped to Winnebago automatically. So that's impacted those numbers as well. Yeah, thanks for saying that again, Santana. Mm -hmm. David Hirsch, ah, try that again. David Hirsch with a question, maybe not specific to this segment, but um, overall, I can easily imagine uh, people needing services from multiple uh, subsets of the various services offered by the Human Services Board. So I'm just wondering, like, I'm looking at the website here. If I am a person who, uh, or maybe I'm trying to direct somebody um, to trying to find the right place to fall in the Human Services. Uh, Department services, um, could they just call that person, just call the general information number? Yes. Okay. And secondly, just department. looking at the website, um, is, is I don't notice a language symbol on it. Is there uh, like a translation or to say maybe Spanish and Hmong available on the website? Is there a version of it? Um, I don't believe so, but that is certainly something that can be worked with with our website designer. Just a thought. I just clicked it. Yeah, There's an accessibility you. button. It doesn't say it. Yeah. One. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. We've had some great presentation material, but I want the board members to know that we're talking by program by program, but a big job of any crisis intervention is what other services in the department are needed in making those referrals. And very similarly, when a child's on a wait list, it is not that, oh, you just sit on a wait list and nothing has happened. We provide referral and case management to available resources that that, that family can access, even though they are waiting on the wait list. 
So I think that's kind of our own little uh, uh, block. You know, we are consistently working together across all of our various programs where people are eligible and can receive services. So I just would want to talk about that. Yeah, Santana reminded me of that actually. So. Yeah, that's helpful and probably answers my question better than I asked it. <laughs> it just there's so many there, there and I think that's the, the one of the points of this training is to help familiarize people like me with with all the different uh, programs that are available. But um, I can just imagine the the general public is it's a confusing uh, uh, um, number of of things that that are offered and not knowing what's what one is eligible for and so on and so forth could be a, a real challenge. You know, you bring a really good point and we don't expect the community to know and understand all of it. But when somebody is needing assistance, they come to us in a general sense to the front door and say, here's what's going on. And it's our job to help them get connected in the right places. And then um, even though you're hearing individually from departments through these or teams, I should say, uh, in these presentations, we're one department, so we work on educating each other internally to help make those connections across the different team and division areas for those services. Excellent. All right, other questions around crisis or crisis services? Okay, thank you, Santana. Thank you, Jess, for your presentation on crisis. And now moving on to community support program or CSP. And I'm gonna hand it over to Jocelyn Lingel Kufner. She is our social work manager in this program. So Jocelyn, the stage is yours. All right. Um, can everyone hear me okay? All right. Um, so in the um, CSP, I will try my best not to say the wrong letters because um, I have been known to say it since there's so many. Um, in CSP, though, we really um, work with individuals who have severe and persistent mental illness, um, and we work as a team. So on our team, um, our, our model is um, we provide services after the ACT model, which is a um, evidence-based model that is really proven to help individuals with this, um, maintain in the community. Um, so our team includes, um, as you can see on here, we have um, the manager, which also I'm the clinical coordinator, uh, substance use specialist, um, a therapist, um, two nurses, we have um, the six social workers who are the case workers. We have a resource specialist. Um, one of the resource specialists does the um, like skills development. And then we have an, the other one who does all the, you know, assisting with scheduling and those things. Um, and also we have the, we have one nurse practitioner the, that we share with um, the clinic. And starting in March, we will have another advanced practice nurse practitioner start that will be providing um, one day a week services to the CSP population only. Um, and we also have a one and a half time voc vocational rehabilitation specialist that joined our team in um, April of 2022 um, that we have been able to assist adding more um, services. Um, okay, can you go to the next slide? The goal of the CSP team is to um, work with individuals who have the um, specific diagnoses, schizophrenia, bipolar, um, those are kind of the two main ones, schizoaffective disorder, uh, major, depressive, major depressive disorder, and then a few others. Um, and our goal is, is that we are an internal team. So like all services that the individuals um, receive are mainly received from us, obviously not medical, but one of the um, services that we provide is um, going to appointments with clients, 
um, a lot of times going to a, a medical health provider can be very overwhelming, confusing. They leave and they have no idea what was said. Um, so we really try to help them get that information and hear that information and then relay that back to them at a later time or figure out what they need to do and assist them in making sure that their physical health needs are met as well as their mental health needs. Um, some of the things we provide is we deliver medications to members in the community in the morning. Some of those individuals, we watch them take their medications to ensure that they're taking their medications. Um, we do a lot of, um, sorry, forgot my thought there. <laughs> we do a lot of just working with individuals to make sure that their needs are met, um, getting shopping, getting out in the community, just all kinds of different needs that individuals may have. Um, helping individuals find housing is a big one, as well as like if they get evicted and trying to find, help them find new housing. Um, all right, next slide. So the um, employment service that we use is called IPS. Um, it is also evidence based service and it is geared towards um, helping individuals with mental health diagnoses get work, regardless of if they're sober or if they're like taking their medications. Um, the goal is really just to start where they're at and hopefully th their mental health symptoms will in will increase with them being able to be employed. Um, we have a story, I have a story to share of um, an individual who was, um, she was looking for a job and, you know, kind of hasn't really had employment on her own. And as we were helping her find this job, it, you could really see her confidence boost as she got the job. She, you know, the, the worker rolled the bus with her, made sure she knew which buses she needed to, to get there and really assisted her in getting getting every step made to get to that job. And she's completely independent in that job at this point, um, but just needing all that help to get that started. And it has really boosted her um, self-esteem and morale, being able to um, have that have that income and have that like purpose. Um, Jocelyn, if I could just add uh, for the board members present, uh, do a bit of stereotyping uh, uh, work. Uh, persons with major mental illness, the, the labels you might hear are things like schizophrenia, uh, uh, endogenous depression, um, bipolar with uh, manic swings. Um, these are people that may have psychotic or uh, severe depression that have a high degree and risk of suicide. And these, uh, Jocelyn mentioned the ACT ACT model, assertive community treatment model, and that is uh, demonstrated to be evidence based at reducing suicide threshold for individuals with these types of conditions. I'll also say that chronically mentally ill folks are less violent than the general population by statistical analysis. And so it's important that we realize that persons with major mental illness are not, usually not, incompetent. These are people that are capable of making their own decisions in their life and the empowerment in combination with medication and treatment for their mental illness can produce a productive lifestyle for people. Work is a required component of the CSB program by statute. And so that's why uh, we have this work program, because we know that just as you might define your life through your work, I've heard Dr. Hirsch mention he's a physician. I go everywhere. I mention I'm a social worker. And persons with um, mental illness who are employed have greater life satisfaction results too. So that just gives a bit of um, fill for uh, these people are part of our community. They deserve every benefit and entitlement of being in our community. And that's a real important mission in the community support program to get people to a lifestyle that is free from stigma and stereotype. Couple questions there, 
uh, is this only till age 65 or do you make them work till they're <laughs> in their 80s? It's a total personal choice. Um, we have some people who are, you know, in their 50s who are like, I'm retired, I don't need a job. And we're like, okay. We really, you know, allow the individual to drive whether they want to look for a job, whether they don't want to look for a job, um, and whether oh, they want to. Oh, I thought Ron just said it was a mandate that they work. What he meant was yeah, it's a let, mandate. Yeah, let me clarify. It's a mandate, a component of the program, Catherine. Of course, okay. you know, if I, if I told my wife I was 55 and I want to retire, she'd want me to get into a CSP program. So <laughs> it, is, it is an individual basis. And, you know, we run across this all the time. And there's a legacy of kind of developmental disabled workshops where people were really forced at deviated labor to work and we're conscious of all those dynamics. What we really see more often though, is that people who have failed over and over again because of their mental health symptoms to maintain a job and they want a job, you know, so that's the most common dynamic. We do have people, hey, I, I don't want to deal with that and they don't. So it is voluntary from the person's perspective, but as okay. a program, we have to offer a work component program to the to, to the CSP licensing. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, to go if you would move to the next slide, I so like I said, we just um, incorporated the IPS part of uh, the educate or the um, voc, voc rehabilitation portion. Um, in our CSP, um, prior to that, we had internal, you know, staff that would help with this, um, but it wasn't a necessarily like a program. Um, and we already have um, 38 individuals who have um, been enrolled in IPS. And I was looking for my number. Um, I think, and though that so that was the end of the end of December 2022, and at that time, I believe we had nine people um, that were competitively employed um, based on working with the, that group of pop, working with that special caseworker to find competitive employment. Um, and then to the next slide, um, I just put in here. Um, so the state requires the CSPs send out um, participant satisfaction surveys as well every year. Um, in 2022, we got 33 of them returned. We have sent out approximately 110. Um, we, we have to send them out to everybody who's currently open in CSP and then as well as anyone who's discharged in the last six months. Um, so we send that out. Um, our rate of return is not super great, which we would like to brainstorm ways to um, increase that. But then the data is stored in a system so that the state can kind of see how all the CSPs are doing with returning their data. Um, but in our 2022 data of the 33 re returned, um, 80. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I am. I was reading my graph wrong. The 90, 91% of them had overall like satisfactory, um, felt that services were satisfactory with them. And then 9% were other, which some of those others were the general or, or the neutral individuals. And then we do have obviously individuals who are, you know, are not satisfied with services. Um, and of our, and, and there's many of our participants that end up in our program for quite a long time. And 83 of the individuals who returned those surveys were in CSP for longer than two years. Um, and one of just the one of the stories that um, comes to mind about like kind of our purpose of keeping individuals in the community and keeping them out of settings was um, last fall we had an individual who had um, stopped taking medications for whatever reason and was slowly declining in his um, mental health symptoms. He was, he'd stopped going to work, he had stopped eating, he had stopped drinking for, for, for all these different reasons of, that were related to his mental health. 
um, he ended up at Winnebago. Um, and, you know, Winnebago was recommending he really needed to go to, you know, locked inpatient. And because he wasn't necessarily super cooperative at um, Winnebago, he has OCD. Um, so he has very, very structured day. And at Winnebago, that was not able to happen. So it really, really was very difficult for him. Um, but the case manager really worked with a group home and and Winnebago to say, instead of going to a lock structure, let's get him into a group home so he can, you know, have that structure that he needs because of his OCD and get back to home. Um, and we were able to, um, he went to the group home instead of Trempolo and he was there three and a half, four months and has returned back to his own housing and has gotten a job again um, and is, you know, really doing well and is is glad, is not glad he was in Winnebago, but is really glad that he was able to skip all the other more, more restrictive placements. Um, and then I just have a couple quotes on here um, from, from our satisfaction survey. I wasn't going to read them because they're kind of hard to read. Um, but, oh, so I will just kind of overall kind of say what the, they say for the individuals who are on the phone. Um, the, the one is uh, an individual who in the last year, she, you know, reports that she has gets stronger every time she sees her providers. Um, she mentions that she is living in her own apartment now. Um, she's in her 60s and this is her first independent living situation. Um, prior to that, she was living in someone's basement with no privacy. Um, the individuals were, you know, kind of taking advantage of her and, you know, making her pay rent and take care of their animals. And it wasn't very clean. Um, and now, you know, she has her own place and in it, she's very proud that she would have never gotten there without the help of CSP. And then the second quote. Um, this individual says that the services that they experienced with CSP have been proven to be helpful. Um, everyone they work with is patient and inspiring, um, and they see the progress in themselves. Um, self growth is self growth has become more apparent, um, and at achieving coping skills in stressful situations. Questions. I feel like I forgot to say some stuff, but. All right, no questions. I will hand it back to Luke. All right, thank you, Jocelyn, for that presentation on our community support program. Um, we are rounding out our presentations in behavioral health with uh, last but certainly not least, Brianna Elbers in treatment court. And so, Brianna, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Luke. And um, I was going to say something about alphabetical order, but I will just reserve that to a later time. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our treatment court program, um, and then we'll have time at the end if there are specifics. But you can see we have five staff, um, five full-time staff in our program, and actually two of those case managers were just hired last month in January. So I am really excited to have a full staff right now moving forward. So what that says there is um, that our treatment courts really are to provide recovery services for individuals that are involved in the criminal justice system that are assessed as high risk. And that means high risk to create um, further or engage in further illegal activity and then also high needs. So that high need is um, a significant substance use disorder um, and or mental health diagnosis. And the vast, vast majority of our clients um, have both a mental health diagnosis as, and a substance use diagnosis. Next slide, please. So what um, services do we offer? You can see here, um, we operate four diversion treatment court programs. And so those are um, 
AIM court or alternatives to incarcerating mothers. And that is in branch six currently with Judge Wickstrom. We also have a branch five treatment court, formerly known as drug court um, with Judge Harless. We have branch three, formerly known as mental health courts with Judge Long. And then our Chippewa Valley Veterans Treatment Court, which is in combination with Chippewa County and Dunn County as well. And though that currently is with Judge Tyson in Branch 4. So um, kind of the services that we offer for any of our clients would be intensive case management services and then diagnostically appropriate treatment services. And those treatment services are largely provided by our outpatient clinic. So we are nestled nicely within the outpatient clinic, both um, in department and in physical space at the county building as well. Other services offered really can be whatever is needed for the client, um, but uh, we do have a peer recovery coach and then sober living home programs as well that we can offer our clients. So some of our goals to the program would be increasing public safety by reducing recidivism. So we track recidivism rates for graduates of our programs for two years. And so our 2018 graduates tracked through the end of um, 2020, 83% of those um, individuals did not get charged with another crime in that two year period. And then the 2019 graduates tracked through the end of 2021, 74% had not been charged with another crime in the two years post-graduation. Um, another goal is to improve behavioral health. And so that is by all of the treatment services that are provided, and that is through the entire program. Our program is a minimum of one year, um, average of 15 months, and they're provided treatment services throughout that time. Another goal. The sound of clapping about those recidivism rates. That's really great. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear any clapping there. Um, and I didn't have, I didn't pull the numbers for end of 2022 um, yet, but I can get those out, out soon. There is um, nationally, it's drug, drug courts is what they call it, but treatment courts um, have greater than 45% um, success over any other um, option that that courts can can assign for people. So um, going on other goals, promoting healthy intact families. So, you know, keeping our families together, keeping um, children in their homes, being able to provide treatment services in the community instead of um, incarceration. And then um, using our justice system resources wisely. So another one of our goals. Um, Speaking about that is how is our program funded? So we received two grants, um, which fund the vast majority of our program. And those are the treatment alternatives and diversion grant known as the TAD grant through the Department of Justice. This pays for um, the supervisor's salary, one of our case managers salaries, room and board for residential treatment, um, all of our drug screens for our clients um, and other various things. And then we also have the treatment alternative program grant that is through the Department of Health Services. And we hold this grant in collaboration with LSS. And so this funds for our recovery coach, our sober living home manager um, and other treatment services. Also training I think is in there and some other things as well. Next slide please. So here are just a couple of graphs we can talk about. Um, so the number of people that we have served, calendar year 21 um, was 50 clients in our community. And in calendar year 22, it's 45 clients. Um, our referrals, so you can see in, in 2021, we had 123 referrals. And in 2022, we had 119 referrals. So anybody can submit a referral to our program um, most often, um, and people are usually interested, is that we get self-referrals. 
the vast majority of our referrals are self referrals. So individuals who um, are charged with a crime or who potentially are facing revocation in their probation status can self refer to the program. Um, other high referrals include the Department of Corrections. Um, so different probation agents refer to our program. And then it would be the public defender's office and the district attorney's office are kind of our highest um, areas where we see um, referrals. So again, they can come from anywhere. Uh, the library social worker is a good one. Um, our internal programs uh, can refer as well. Once somebody is referred to the program, it would go through our triage team meeting. So that is another multidisciplinary team that looks at eligibility and appropriateness criteria. So um, just a quick overview, somebody is eligible if they are an adult, if they are a resident of Eau Claire County, if their um, previous history is nonviolent. And I know we've had a little bit of discussions about that today. Um, and we we took out that um, for veterans court, just knowing the, the history of veterans as well. And um, if there is a deferment, right? So there has to be a diversion, um, jail day diversion for people to be eligible to be in our program. So again, that eligibility is related to their risk level. So they have to be high risk um, and then also high needs as well. So do they have a significant substance use and or mental health diagnosis um, of which they would need treatment services for? Um, and then the last graph up there um, is kind of a fun one I like to talk about is our jail bed days saved. So these are for um, graduates of our program. Instead of um, incarceration, they did this community-based treatment program and so then no longer had to sit the stayed sentence that was ordered. And so for calendar year, 2021, and that was 2,419 days saved um, for jail. And in 2022, that was 3,234 jail bed days were saved um, by doing treatment in the community in lieu of incarceration. So that was a really high um, and quick overview. Does anybody have questions about treatment court? This is Nancy Coffey, and I just have one comment. I just okay. think um, what Supervisor Schneider was talking about with um, how we're diverting people from ending up back in jail and also how they're assimilating into the community. Um, the programming, um, I used to work for extension with the FoodWise program, and we used to do some education with mostly AIM Court students uh, or um, people, and it was great to see them so excited about learning how to cook for their families and um, be so family oriented. I just wonder, can we do more? Are there, uh, how many people can you handle a year and how do we get more people into these programs? Yeah, um, we could handle more. Uh, we're not at capacity right now. Um, we, what we find is that we have people kind of wait for an extended period of time for pending cases or revocation proceedings to be concluded. Um, and for whatever reason, that's, that seems to be taking quite a long time. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're doing our best to, um, do outreach. We have talked with the public defender's office, you know, multiple times. Um, the district attorney's office, Department of Corrections, law enforcement, um, you know, wherever we can to kind of remind people that we're, we're still here. And so, um, yeah, I, we're, we're working to, um, continue to increase those numbers. This is Kathy Clark. I have a comment which can be used as a question too, I guess. Um, maybe it's because I'm not that directly involved with the county board per se anymore. 
Um, but treatment courts used to get a lot more attention than they do now. And maybe that's become because of the lower numbers, or maybe it's a difference in attitudes on some of the, you know, people who are who are working with the program, let's say the judges or or whatever. Um, I it, it's a valuable program. I mean, I look at the days saved. I look at the recidivism rate. Um, and I think we need maybe the newspaper needs to do an article on the successes of these courts so that people in the community know more about them, know that they exist, know that they work. Um, I, I just think more attention needs to be given to the treatment courts than they're, than they're getting right now. Done with my soapbox. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, thank, thank you for you. that. Yeah, thank you for that comment. And, you know, I think COVID has had a little bit of an impact on that component, the component here within treatment courts. Um, certainly has impacted programs across the department and, and then, you know, lots and lots of ways. But I, I do think that this is part of the impact. And um, there is a lot, there is still incredible respect and support of the treatment courts throughout administration and the criminal justice system. So there's incredible collaboration going on. And as um, Brianna indicated, there is um, discussions with the, directly with the courts and, and the, the chief um, judge, Judge Schumacher, along with district attorney and other entities that are involved as a community it's um, certainly something that can be helped to be shared around, as you indicate, from a community perspective. It is a program, though, that comes through the courts and not directly from the community. So it has a little bit of a nuance compared to some other of those programs, as you know. This is Kim um, with a question, if you can hear me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm curious about, uh, you kind of mentioned we had a conversation or at least we're, we're talking briefly about the violent versus nonviolent, um, I guess, requirements, I'll say, to be able to get into a treatment court. Um, you said that we removed that for um, Veterans Court, and I, I'm just curious with I guess some of the conversation earlier, like who's we and how did that, who made that determination? How did that occur? And then I, I also, um, I think about what, what Nancy was offering and had, had kind of shared. I think, you know, when you, when you reduce people's recidivism rates, that's an outcome of something else. That's an outcome, a, a positive outcome, but an outcome of all of the other things that were implemented that either, you know, people's mental wellness improved, people's connection to families improved, people were employed, people had maybe not just a job, but a career path, their self-esteem improved, improved, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I think about that when we look at kind of providing that information to the community, not just the recidivism rate information, but like what were some of the other pieces to that success story that led to people not having new convictions, and then understanding as well, and I think it's really important for communities um, to understand that, you know, incarceration in and of itself is really um, not only a criminogenic factor, it increases, you know, people's um, risk, but that it's also really a, a, an adverse health outcome, and I think people are paying a lot more attention to it as a as a um, as a health adversity, and I sit on the board of health as well, so just FYI. But that's really important to me that we look at not not taking away accountability. I fully believe in accountability, um, but just is that the healthiest and most well 
option um, for people. So looking at ways to, as I think Nancy was pointing out, like how do we increase those people's ability to participate? Um, so I guess that leads back to my first question when you said we were able to remove that from Veterans Court. I'm just wondering why some of these other factors maybe wouldn't be considered outside of um, Veterans Court and what work is being done um, to do so, because it does improve the wellness of our community period. So just curious, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so part of this comes down to our funding source, specifically the TAD grant. Um, and that is through the Department of Justice. And so the TAD grant restricts violent offenders for being in, in treatment courts. Um, and we have had a lot of conversations with uh, the Department of Justice about this exclusionary criteria because we have found that that is the largest um, reason that individuals are deemed not eligible for the program. So, with that being said, they've told us that there's a lot of conversations happening at their level to potentially look at that and change the guideline. But that's um, that's kind of the why it is for um, for our treatment court. So, if we talk about veterans court specifically, veterans court is not funded through that grant through the TAD grant. And so there was discussions um, multiple years ago about um, what what does that mean or what does that look like in terms of persons who have um, violent offenses in their history? You know, could we could we be more open with this? Could we look at this in a different way? And so that was um, approved through the governing board of the treatment courts or the oversight committee, I should say, um, to look at, yes, we can look at um, veterans that have um, been charged with violent offenses in their history to still be appropriate for our veterans court program. Did that, that answer your question? I know you said something too about other other areas to look at in regards to uh, recidivism rates, and we do track that. I didn't um, talk about it for this presentation, but we do track um, improvement in housing, improvement in um, employment, and then um, engagement in pro-social activities as well. So we we do have data on all of that. Um, I know those were some of the areas you were talking about in correlation with recidivism as well. I guess, and I appreciate that explanation. I guess my real question then is, is it a matter of local will and discretion? Like, do we have that ability and funding? Obviously, you know, budgets and funding, I, I understand the complicatedness um, of that and, and importance to, you know, it varies with people as to what they're passionate about and what and what they see as important to fund. Um, I'm just curious, is it bottom line a matter of local, do we have the discretion? Is it local will and funding source that that could be moved? Or would a law have to change or would a, a, a would something have to change statewide or would there, as long as there was a local will to do so, that could be, um, that barrier could be more alleviated for people to enter treatment courts if they weren't a veteran. So I can comment uh, on that, Kim, that it is a federal guideline and the law would have to change in order to be able to, to utilize those funds for individuals who had violent offenses. One of the areas that we were able to make a change, um, particularly uh, around some exclusionary criteria was with predatory drug dealing uh, because essentially what we had was no real definition around what is predatory drug dealing and so those folks who were uh, who were charged with a predatory drug dealing offense were no longer eligible for treatment court well what we noticed was there was a disproportionate amount of individuals of color who fell under that predatory drug dealing umbrella and so really we were uh, restricting a number of individuals from accessing treatment court. That was a, that was a, um, 
an instance where we were able to make that change. We were able to, to shift that view of what is predatory drug dealing and put a much better um, kind of parameter around it in order to, to allow more folks to come into our treatment court. Perfect case in point, and I'll, I'll end my questions, but a perfect case in point. So it's, it, honestly, it sounds like it's a, it's a local will. Yes, you may not be able to take funding um, to have that option, but if we have local funding, there's nothing that prohibits, prohibits us from shifting funding, correct? It's just will. Um, the, so we would have to check that. Sometimes the grant doesn't allow you to, in that program area, you have to follow the rules of the grant perhaps, but um, there, we hear what you are saying, Kim. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good questions. Other questions? At a certain point, we need to let staff go home. And I think we're getting close. <laughs> yeah, we actually came to the end of our um, education session. Um, as said in the beginning by Luke that we're willing to answer questions at any time. The session has been recorded. We will let you know where the recording is and how to access that when that gets set up. And um, we are incredibly appreciative of being able to present all of this information to you. And again, thank you so much to all of the staff for your work and being here together. It was, I found it to be very interesting and I talk about this stuff all day long, so. Great job. job. Thanks so much. Yes, and thank you for being here. And again, thank you to all the staff for their knowledge and wisdom around their programs. All right. Next couple of days off, huh? Uh, okay. We'll do it. Thank